Have you ever known someone who seemed to have a pathological need to be liked by others? Now, according to theorist Karen Horney, yes, it's pronounced as Horney and not Horny, <laughs> this behavior is due to a neurotic need for affection and approval. In her book, Self Analysis, Horney outlined the psychoanalytic social theory, which assumes that social and cultural conditions, especially childhood experiences, are largely responsible for shaping personality. People who uh, do not have their needs uh, for love and affection satisfied during childhood develop basic hostility towards their parents and, as a consequence, suffer from basic anxiety. Horney theorized that people combat basic anxiety by adopting one of three fundamental styles of relating to others, moving towards people, moving against people, and moving away from people. Normal individuals may use any of these modes of relating to other people, but neurotics are compelled to rigidly rely on one. Uh, their compulsive behaviors generates a basic intrapsychic conflict that may take the form of either an idealized self-image or self-hatred. Now, the idealized self-image is expressed as neurotic search for glory, uh, neurotic claims, or neurotic pride. Self-hatred, on the other hand, is expressed as either self-contempt or alienation from the self. Now, although horn eyes writings are concerned mostly uh, with neurotic personality, many of her ideas can also be applied to normal individuals. This video looks at Horn Eyes' basic theory on neurosis. Uh, as with other personality theorists, Horn Eyes' views of, on personality are a reflection of her life experiences. Bernard Paris, in 1994, wrote that Horn Eyes' insights were derived from her efforts to relieve her own pain as well as the, uh, that of her patients. If her sufferings had been less intense, her insights would have been less profound. Now let's talk about, with that said, let's talk about Horn Eyes' biography. Now, uh, Karen Danielson Horn Eye was born in Abeck, a small town near Hamburg, Germany, on September uh, 15, 1880, uh, 1885, uh, she was the only daughter of Bernd Danielsen and a, uh, a sea captain and Clotilda van Ro uh, Ronzelen uh, Danielsen, a woman nearly 18 years younger than her husband. Now, uh, the only other child of this marriage was a son about four years older than Karen. However, the old sea captain had been married earlier and had four other children, most of whom were already adults by the time Horney was born. Now, the Danielson, uh, the Danielson family, that is, was an unhappy one, uh, in part because Karen's older half-siblings turned their, uh, their father against his second wife. Karen felt great hostility towards her stern, devoutly religious father and regarded him as a religious hypocrite. However, she idolized her mother, who both supported and protected her against the stern uh, old sea captain. Nevertheless, Karen was not a happy child. She resented the favored treatment given to her older brother, and in addition, she was worried about the bitterness and discord between her parents. Now, as a teenager, uh, she suffered her first episode of depression, a challenge uh, that she faced several times throughout her life. Now, uh, when she was 80 or when she was 13, Horn I decided to become a physician, but at that time, no university in Germany admitted women. So by the time she was 16, the situation had actually changed. So Horn I, over the objections of her father, who wanted her to stay home and take care of the household, entered the gymnasium, a school that would lead to a university and then to medical school. Now, on her own for the first time, Karen 
dreamed to remain independent for the rest of her life. But according to Paris, Horn Eye's independence was mostly super superficial. On a deeper level, she retained a compulsive need to merge with a great man. This morbid dependency, which typically included idealization and fear of inciting angry rejection, haunted Horn Eye during her relationships with a series of men. And in 1906, she entered the University of Freiburg, becoming one of uh, the first women in Germany to study medicine. There, she met Oscar Horney, a political scientist student, science student, uh, and their relationship began as a friendship, but it eventually became a romantic one. After their marriage in 1909, the couple settled in Berlin, where Oscar, now with a PhD, worked for a coal company, and Karen, not yet uh, with an MD, specialized in psychiatry. Now, the early years of her marriage were filled with many notable personal experiences for Hornay. Her father and mother, who were now separated, died within less than a year of each other. She gave birth to three daughters in five years, and she received her MD degree in 1915 after five years of psychoanalysis. And in her quest for the right man, she had several love affairs. After World War I, the Horn Eyes lived a prosperous uh, suburban life lifestyle with several servants and chauffeurs. Oscar did well financially, while Karen enjoyed a thriving uh, psychoanalytic uh, practice or psychiatric practice. This idyllic scene, however, soon ended. Uh, the inflation and economic discord of 1923 uh, cost Oscar his job and the family was forced to move back to an apartment in Berlin. In 1926, Karen and Oscar separated but did not officially divorce until 1933. Uh, 1938 that is. Now the early years following her separation from Oscar were the most productive of Horney's life. In addition to seeing patients and caring for three daughters, she became more involved with writing, teaching, traveling, and lecturing. Her papers now showed uh, important differences with Freudian theory. She believed that culture, not, auto uh, not anatomy, was responsible for psychic differences between men and women. When Freud reacted negatively to Horney's position, she became even more out outspoken in her opposition. In 1932, Horney left Germany for a position as associate direct, uh, director of the newly established Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, in 1932, Horney left Germany for that position. In 1950, Horney published her most important work, Neurosis and Human Growth. This book set forth theories that were no longer merely a reaction to Freud, but rather were an expression on her, of her own creativity and independent thinking. And after uh, a short illness, Horney died of cancer on December 4, 1952. She was 65 years old. Now, after, uh, now that we have talked about Car uh, Horn Eyes uh, biography, let's now move on to uh, the basic ideas of psychoanalytic social theory. Now, uh, the early writings of Horney, like those of Adler, Hume, and Klein, have distinctive Freudian flavors. Like Adler and Hume, she eventually became disenchanted with orthodox psychoanalytic uh, uh, theory and constructed a revisionist theory that reflected her own personal experiences, clinical and otherwise. Although Horn I wrote nearly exclusively about neurosis and neurotic personality, her work suggests much uh, that is appropriate to normal healthy development. Culture, especially early childhood experiences, play a leading role in shaping human personality, either neurotic or uh, healthy. Horney uh, then agreed with Freud that early childhood traumas 
are important. But she differed from him in her insistence that social rather than biological forces are paramount in personality development. Hornay criticized Freud's theories on several uh, accounts. First, the co uh, she cautioned that strict adherence to orthodox psychoanalysis would lead to stagnation in both theor theoretical thought and therapeutic practice. Second, uh, Horneye uh, objected to Freud's ideas on feminine psychology, a subject uh, which we will return earlier. Third, she stressed that view or the view that psychoanalysis should move beyond instinct theory and emphasize the importance of cultural influences in shaping personality. According to her, man is ruled not by the pleasure principle alone, but by two guiding principles, safety and satisfaction. Similarly, she claimed that neuroses are not the result of in instincts, but rather of that person's attempt to find path through a, well, a wilderness of, uh, full of unknown dangers. This wilderness is created by society and not by instincts or anatomy. Despite becoming increasingly critical of Freud, Horney continued to recognize his per, uh, perceptive insights. Her main quarrel with Freud was not so much uh, the accuracy of his observations, but the validity of her of his interpretations. Rather, in general terms, she had uh, she held that Freud's explanations result in a pessimistic concept of humanity based on innate instincts and the stagnation of personality. In contrast, her view of humanity is an optimistic one and is concerned of, of, of cultural forces that are amenable to change. We can summarize Horney's theory in two uh, important points. First is about the impact of culture on personality. Although Horney did not overlook the importance of genetic factors, she repeatedly emphasized the, the uh, emphasized cultural influences as the primary basis of both neurotic and, and, and uh, normal personality development. Modern culture, she contended, is based on competition among individuals. Uh, she said that everyone is a real or potential competitor of everyone else. Uh, and, and competitiveness and the basic hostility it spawns uh, result in feelings of isolation. These feelings of being alone in a potentially hostile world lead to intensified need for affection, which in turn causes people to overvalue love. As a result, many people see love and affection as the solution for all their problems. Genuine love, of course, can be healthy, growth-producing uh, experiences, but the desperate need for love such as that uh, shown by Horneye herself, provide a fertile ground for the development of neurosis. Rather than benefiting from the need for love, neurotics uh, strive in pathological ways to find it. Their self-defeating attempts result in low self-esteem, increased hostility, basic anxiety, and more competitiveness, and a continuous excessive need for love and affection. According to Horn I, Western societies, and the way I see it, Westernized cultures included, uh, contribute in this vicious cycle in, 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 in several respects. First, people of this society are imbued with the cultural teachings of kinship and humility. These teachings, however, run contrary to another prevailing attitude, namely aggressiveness and the drive to win or be superior. Second, society's demand for success and achievements are nearly endless so that even when people achieve their material ambition, additional goals are continually being uh, placed before them. Third, Western cultures uh, tell people that they are free, that they can accomplish anything through hard work and per uh, perseverance, but in reality, the freedom of most people is greatly restricted by genetics, social position, and the competitiveness of others. These contradictions, all stemming from cultural influences rather than biological ones, provide intrapsychic conflicts 
that threaten the psychological health of normal people and provide nearly unsurmountable obstacle for neurotics. Now, the second point is about the importance of childhood experiences. Horn, I believe that neurotics, uh, or rather neurotic conflicts, can stem from almost any developmental stages. But childhood is the age from which the vast majority of problems arise. A variety of traumatic events such as uh, sexual uh, abuse, beating, open rejection, or pervasive neglect uh, may leave their impressions on a child's future development. But Horn I insisted that these debilitating uh, experiences can almost invariably be traced to lack of genuine warmth and affection. Horn I's own lack of love from her father and her close relationships with her mother must have had a powerful effect on her personal development as well as on her theoretical ideas. Horn I hypothesized that uh, a difficult childhood is, prim is primarily responsible for neurotic needs. This need becomes powerful because they are the child's only means of gaining feelings of safety. Nevertheless, uh, no single experience is responsible for late personality. Horn I cautioned that the sum total of childhood experiences bring about a certain character structure or rather starts uh, uh, its development. In other words, the totality of early relationships mold personality development. Later attitudes uh, to others then are not repetitions of infantile ones but emanate from the character structure, the basis of which is laid in childhood. Although later experiences can have important effects, especially in normal individuals, childhood experiences are primarily responsible for personality development. People who rigidly repeat uh, patterns of behaviors do so because they interpret new experiences in a manner consistent with those established personalities. Now, Horn, I believe that each person begins life with the potential for healthy development. But like other living organisms, or yeah, people need favorable conditions for growth. These conditions must include a warm and loving environment, yet one that is not overly uh, permissive. Children need to experience both genuine love and healthy discipline. Such conditions provide them with feelings of safety and satisfaction and permit them to grow in accordance with their real self. Unfortunately, a multitude of adverse influences may interfere with these favorable conditions. Primary among these is the parent's inability or unwillingness to love their child. Because of their own neurotic needs, parents often uh, dominate, neglect, overprotect, reject, or overindulge. If parents do not satisfy their child's need for safety and satisfaction, the child develops feelings of basic hostility towards the parents. However, children seldom overly uh, express this hostility as rage. Instead, they repress these hostilities towards their parents and have no awareness of it. Repressed hostility then leads to profound feelings of insecurity and a vague sense of apprehension. This condition is called basic anxiety, which Horn I defined as a feeling of being isolated and helpless in a world conceived as potentially hostile. Earlier, she gave more a more graphic description, calling basic anxiety a feeling of being small, insignificant, and helpless, uh, deserted, uh, endangered in a world that is out of, out to abuse, cheat, attack, and humiliate, and betray and envy. Uh, Horney believed that basic hostility and basic anxiety are inextricably interwoven with each other. In that. Uh, 
hostile impulses are the principal source of basic anxiety. But basic anxiety can also contribute to feelings of hostility. This means that while hostility leads to anxiety, anxiety can also lead to hostility. As, a, an, exa as an example of how basic hostility can lead to anxiety, Horn I in 1937 wrote about a young man with repressed hostility who went on a hiking trip in the mountains with a young woman whom he was deeply in love. He repressed hostil his re repressed hostility, however, also led him to become jealous of the woman. While walking on a dangerous mountain pass, the young man suddenly suffer uh, suffered from a severe anxiety attack in the form of rapid heart rate and heavy breathing. The anxiety resulted from a seemingly inappropriate but conscious impulse to push the young woman over the edge of the mountain pass. In this case, basic hostility led to severe anxiety, but anxiety and fear can also lead to strong feelings of hostility. Children who feel, threat, uh, feel, feel threatened by their parents develop a reactive hostility in defense of that threat. This reactive hostility in turn may create additional anxiety, thus uh, completing the interactive circle between hostility and anxiety. In 1937, uh, uh, Horn I contended that uh, it does not matter whether anxiety or hostility has been the primary factor. The important point is that their reciprocal influence may intensify a neurosis without a person experiencing any additional outside conflict. Now, basic anxiety in itself is not the neurosis, but it's uh, the nutritive soil out of which a definitive neurosis may develop at any time. Basic anxiety is constant and unrelenting, needing no particular stimulus such as a taking a test in school or giving a speech. It permeates all relationships with others and lead to unhappy ways of trying to cope with people. Although she later amended her list of defenses against basic anxiety, Horn I originally identified four uh, general ways that people protect themselves against feelings uh, of being alone in a potentially hostile world. The first is affection, a strategy that does not always lead to authentic love. In their search for affection, some people may try to purchase love with self uh, effect. Uh, effect Efficacing compliance, material goods, or sexual favors. The second protective device is submissiveness. Neurotics may submit themselves either to people or to institutions such as an organization or a religion. Neurotics who submit to another person often do so in order to gain affection. Neurotics may also try to protect themselves by striving for power, prestige, or possession. Power is a defense against the real or imagined hostility of others and take the form of a tendency to dominate others. Prestige is a protection against humiliation and is expressed as a tendency to humiliate others. Possession acts as a buffer against uh, this destitution and poverty and manifests itself as a tendency to deprive other people. The fourth protective mechanism is withdrawal. Neurotics uh, frequently uh, protect themselves against basic anxiety uh, uh, either by developing an independence from others or by becoming emotionally detached from, uh, from other people. By psychologically withdrawing uh, themselves, neurotics feel that they cannot be hurt by other people. Now, these protective factors or protective de uh, devices did not necessarily indicate a neurosis, and Horn I believe that all people use them to some extent. They become unhealthy when people feel compelled to rely on them and are thus unable to imply a variety of interpersonal strategies. Compulsion then is the is the salient characteristic of all of all neurotic drives. 
Now, if you think about it, neurotics uh, or neurotic individuals have the same problem that affect normal people, except that neurotics experience them to a greater degree. Everyone uses the various protective devices to guard against rejection, humili uh, hostility, and competitiveness of others. But whereas normal individuals are able to use a variety of defense maneuvers in a somewhat useful way, neurotics compulsively repeat the same strategy in an essentially unproductive manner. Horney insisted that neurotics do not enjoy misery and suffering. They cannot change their behavior by free, uh, by free will but must continually and compulsively protect themselves against basic anxiety. This defensive strategy traps them in a vicious cycle in which their compulsive needs uh, to reduce basic anxiety leads to behaviors that perpetuate low self-esteem, generalized hostility, and inappropriate striving for power. Uh, this may also include inflated feelings of superiority and persist ap persistent apprehension, all of which result f uh, in more basic anxiety. Now, according to Horney, basic anxiety and therefore neurosis could result from a variety of situations, including direct or indirect domination, dif indifference, erratic behavior, lack of respect for the child's individual needs, lack of real guidance, disparaging attitudes, too much admiration or the absence of it, lack of reliable warmth, having to take sides in parental disagreements, too much or too little responsibility, overprotection, isolation from other children, injustice, discrimination, unkept promises, hostile atmosphere, and so on and so on. Now, these neurotic needs can be classified into three broad categories. The first is compliance uh, or the need. Uh, uh, they are needs that move you towards other people. They uh, guard you from feelings of helplessness. These neurotic needs cause individuals to seek affirmation and acceptance from others. They are often described as needy or clingy as they seek out uh, approval and love from others. Now, in her writings, she used a number of other phrases to refer to these three strategies. Besides compliance, she referred to the first as moving towards strategy and as the self effect uh, and the self effacing solution. The second is aggression or needs that move you against other people. They serve as protection against hostility of others. These neurotic needs result in hostility and a need to control other people. These individuals are often described as difficult, domineering, and unkind. Because aggression, or rather besides aggression, the second was referred to as moving against and uh, the expansive solution. The third is withdrawal or needs that move you away from other people. They guard you from feelings of isolation. These neurotic needs create hostility and antisocial behavior. These individuals are often described as cold, indifferent, and aloof. And besides withdrawal, she called the third, uh, the third neurotic trend as moving away from others and the resigning solution. Now, neurotic people tend to utilize two or more of these uh, ways of coping, uh, creating conflict, turmoil, and, and, and confusion. Well-adjusted individuals utilize all three of these strategies, towards, away, and against, shifting uh, focus depending on internal and external factors. So what is it that makes these coping strategies neurotic? Now, according to Horney, it's the overuse of one or more of these interpersonal styles. Now, in here, we see Horney's conception of the mutual in, uh, influence of basic hostility 
and then basic anxiety, which, which we have already explored earlier, as well as both normal and neurotic defenses against anxiety. Now, people can use each of these neurotic trends to solve basic conflict, but unfortunately, these solutions are essentially non-productive or neurotic. Now, Horn, I use the term basic conflict because she, uh, because very young children are driven in all three directions, uh, towards, against, and away from other people in health. Uh, now, in healthy children, these three drives are not necessarily incompatible, but the feelings of isolation and helplessness that Horn, I described as basic anxiety drive some children to act compulsively thereby limiting their repertoire of a sing, uh, to a single neurotic trend. Experiencing basically contradictory attitudes towards others, these children attempt to solve this basic conflict by making one of these three neurotic trends consistently dominant. Some children move towards people by behaving in a compliant manner as a protection against feelings of helplessness. Other children move against people with acts of aggression in order to circumvent the hostility of others. And still other children move away from people by adopting a detached manner, thus alleviating feelings of isolation. Now, you can see here that defenses can have both normal and neurotic versions. Uh, the, the normal defenses are spontaneous movement. When uh, someone is moving towards people, they are being friendly or they have a loving personality. When they are against people, uh, it triggers a survivor or like a sur uh, it, it's triggered by survival in a competitive society. And when they move away from people, it's for autonomy and serene personality. On the other hand, um, neurotic defenses are compulsive in nature. When they move uh, towards people, or pe when, when people with this trend move towards people, it's because they are or they have compliant personality. When they uh, move against people, it's because they have aggressive personality. And when they move away from people, it means they have a uh, detached personality. Now, uh, Horney's theory is perhaps the best theory of neurosis we have. First, she offered a different way of viewing neurosis. She was... Uh, she saw it as much more continuous with a normal life than previous theorists. Specifically, she saw neurosis as an attempt to make life bearable, as a way of interpersonal uh, control and coping. This is, of course, what we all strive to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Only most of us seem to be doing all right, while neurotics seem to be sinking fast. Now, in her clinical experience, she discerned 10 particular patterns of neurotic needs. They are based on things that we all need, but they have become distorted in several ways by the difficulties of some people's lives. Now, let's take the first uh, need, the need for affection and approval, which we will be to uh, talking more about later, uh, as an example. So, all, we all need affection, if you think about it. So, what makes such a need neurotic? First, the need is unrealistic, unreliable, or indiscriminate. For example, we all need uh, affection, but we don't expect it from everyone we meet. We don't expect great outpouring of affection from people, uh, even our close friends and relations. We don't expect our loved ones to show affection all the time in all circumstances. We don't expect great show of love while our par partners are, f uh, are filing out uh, tax uh, forms or registering to vote or getting themselves vaccinated. And we realize that there may be times in our lives when we have to be self-sufficient. Uh, second, the neurotic's need is much more intense and he or she will experience great anxiety if uh, the need is not met or if it even appears that it may not be met in the future.
in this, of course, uh, it, uh, uh, it is this, of course, that leads to the unrealistic nature of the need. Affection, to continue uh, the example, has to be shown clearly all the time, in all circumstances, by all people, or the panic sets in. The neurotics have uh, has made uh, the need to central to their own existence. Now, the neurotic needs are as follows. First is, as I have said earlier, the neurotic need for affection and approval. Now, this need includes the desire to be liked, to please other people, and meet the expectation of others at all costs. People with this type of need are extremely sensitive to rejection and criticism and fear the, uh, the anger or hostility of others. The, uh, the first need falls under the neurotic thread of compliance. Um, you may want to pay attention to the, uh, to the color of the box to uh, guide you to which neurotic trend this need uh, fits in. So red is for the first need. Uh, blue is for the second need and green is for the third trend pala. Uh, what I wanted to say is red is for the first trend, blue is for the second trend, and green is for the third trend. Alright, because this is red, it means it falls under the first trend. Okay, so the second uh, is the neurotic need for a partner who will take over one's life. This includes the idea that love will solve all of one's problems. Again, we all would like a partner to share life with, but the neurotic goes a step further or too far. Uh, this involves the need to be centered uh, on a partner. People with this need suffer extreme fear of being abandoned by their partner. Oftentimes, these individuals place an exaggerated importance of love and believing that having a partner will resolve all of life's trouble. Now, like the first need, this need falls under the neurotic trend of compliance. The third is the neurotic need to restrict one's life within narrow borders. Individuals with this need prefer to remain inconspicuous and unnoticed. They are undemanding and content with little things. They avoid wishing for material things, often making their own needs secondary and undervaluing their own talents and abilities. Even this has uh, its normal counterpart if you think about it. Who hasn't felt the need to simply uh, to, to live a simple life when it gets too stressful, to, to join a monastic order, disappearing uh, disappear into routine or, or, or disappearing to a vacation spot where people won't be able to, to, to reach you or even to return to the womb. So this need curiously falls under both compliance and withdrawal neurotic trends. The fourth is the neurotic need for power. We all seek strength. But the neurotic may be desperate for it. This is dominance for its own sake, often accompanied by a contempt for the weak and a strong belief in one's own rational powers. Uh, people with this need usually praise strength, despise weakness, and will exploit or dominate other people. These people fear personal limitations, uh, helplessness, and uncontrollable situations. Now, this need falls ad under the aggression neurotic trend. Fifth is the neurotic need to exploit others. The individuals or these individuals view others in terms of what can be gained through association with them. People with this need generally pride themselves on their ability to exploit other people and are often focused on manipulating others to obtain desired objectives, including such things as ideas, power, money, or even sex. In the ordinary person, this might be the need to have an effect, to have an impact, to be heard. In the neurotic, it can be, uh, or rather, it can become manipulation 
uh, gaslighting and the belief that people are there to be used. It may also involve a fear of being used and uh, of looking stupid. You may have noticed that the people who love practical jokes more often than not cannot take being the butt of such jokes themselves. Now, like the fourth need, this need falls under the aggression neurotic trend. Uh, now, the, neuro uh, the sixth is the neurotic need to uh, for, for prestige. Now, individuals with a need for prestige value themselves in terms of public recognition, acclaim, and uh, in, in, in uh, current society, uh, likes, TikTok views, and even being uh, influencers or famous. Now, material possession, personality characteristic, professional accomplishment, and love, uh, and, and loved ones are evaluated based on prestige values. These individuals often fear public embarrassment and loss of social uh, status. We are all social creatures and, well, sexual ones, and like uh, to be appreciated uh, ourselves. But these people are overwhelmingly concerned with appearance and popularity. They fear being ignored, uh, be thought uh, plain, uncool, or out of it. Like the fourth, uh, the fifth uh, need, the, uh, the, sixth, uh, the sixth need falls under the second trend uh, of aggression. Now the seventh is the neurotic need for personal admiration. Now, individuals with a neurotic need for personal admirations are narcissistic and have an exaggerated self-perception. They want to be admired based on this image or rather imagined self-view, not upon how they really are. Now, we all need to be admired for inner qualities as well as outer ones. We need to feel important and valued. But some people are more desperate and need to remind everyone of their importance. Uh, nobody recognizes a genius or, or they might say things like, I'm the real power behind the scenes, you know, or, or and so on. Now, their fear is of being thought as nobodies, unimportant and meaningless. Now, like the fi fourth, fifth, and sixth need, the seventh need falls under the neurotic trend of aggression. Number eight is uh, the neurotic need for personal achievement. According to Horn Eye, people push themselves to achieve greater and greater things as a result of basic insecurity. Uh, insecurity. These individuals fear failure and feel a, con a constant need to accomplish more than other people and to top even their own earlier successes. Again, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with achievement far from it right but some people are obsessed with it they have to be number one at everything they do since uh, this is of course quite a difficult task you will find this uh, people devaluating anything they cannot uh, be number one in if they are good runners then uh, the, the, uh, the discus and the hammer are sideshows if academic abilities are their strength Physical abilities are of no importance and so on. Now, uh, like the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh uh, need, uh, the eighth need uh, falls under the aggression neurotic trend. Now, the ninth uh, neurotic need is the neurotic need for self-sufficiency and independence. Now, we should all cultivate some autonomy. But some people feel that they shouldn't ever be, uh, they shouldn't ever need anybody else. They tend to refuse help and are often reluctant to commit to a relationship. These individuals exhibit a loner mentality, distancing themselves from others in order to avoid being tied down or de uh, dependent upon other people. Now, this neurotic need falls under the third uh, neurotic trend of withdrawal. Now, 
the, the last need, uh, the last neurotic need is the neurotic need for perfection and unassailability uh, to become better and better at life and our special uh, interest is hardly neurotic but some people are driven to be perfect and scared of being flawed they cannot be caught making a mistake and need to be in control all the time these individuals constantly strive for complete infallibility. A common feature of this neurotic need is uh, searching for personal flaws in order to quickly change or cover up these perceived imperfections. Now, while popular culture often paints neurotic behavior as quirky and cute, Neurosis may actually play a role in mood and anxiety uh, problems. Recognizing your own neurotic tendencies can help you uh, better understand your own behaviors. By addressing these issues, people can often improve their overall mental health and wellness. Researchers have actually found that mindfulness or being aware of your own thoughts might be a useful approach uh, for, com for combating neurotic uh, negative thoughts that contribute to worry, anxiety, and relationship problems. Now, Horney had one more way of looking at neurosis in terms of self-images. For Horney, the self is the core of your being your potential. If you were healthy, you would have an accurate conception of who you are and uh, you would then be free to realize that potential or self-realization. Now, intra-psychic conflicts are inner conflicts that both normal and neurotic people uh, experience. Intra-psychic processes originate from interpersonal experiences, but as they become uh, part of a person's belief system, they develop a life of their own, an existence separate from the interpersonal conflicts that gave them life. Look, uh, let us look at two important intrapsychic conflicts, the idealized self-image and uh, self-hatred. Briefly, the idealized self-image is an attempt to solve conflicts by painting a godlike picture of oneself. Self-hatred, on the other hand, is an interrelated yet equally irrational and powerful tendency to despise one's real self. So, uh, Horney believed that human beings, uh, if given an environment of discipline and warmth will develop feelings of, uh, of security and self-confidence and a tendency to move towards self-realization. Feeling alienated for, uh, from themselves, people need desperately to acquire a stable sense of identity. This dilemma can be solved only by creating an idealized self-image, an extravagantly positive view of themselves uh, that exists only in their personal belief system. As the idealized self-image becomes solidified, neurotics begin to believe in the reality of that image. So, uh, Horn I recognized three aspects of the idealized self-image. The neurotic search for glory, neurotic claims, and neurotic pride. Now, the neurotic search for glory means that as neurotics come to believe in the reality of their idealized self, they begin to incorporate it in all aspects of their life. So, their, their goals, their self-concept, and their relations with others. Horn, I referred to this as the comprehensive drive towards actualizing the ideal self as the neurotic search for glory. In addition to self-idealization, the neurotic search for glory includes three other elements, the need for perfection, neurotic ambition, and the drive towards vindicative triumph. The need for perfection refers to the drive to mold the whole personality into an idealized self. Neurotics are not contented to merely make a few alterations. Nothing short of completing perfections or complete perfection is acceptable. They try to achieve perfection by erecting a complex set of shoulds and should nots. 
uh, Horn Eye in 1950 referred to this drive as the tyranny of the should. A second key element in the neurotic search for glory is neurotic ambition. That is, the compulsive drive towards superiority. The third aspect of neurotic search for glory is the drive towards a vindictive triumph, the most destructive element of all. The need for a vindictive triumph may be disguised as a drive for achievement or success, but it, uh, its chief aim is to put others to shame or defeat them through one's very success or to attain the power to inflict suffering on them mostly uh, of a humiliating kind. Now, the second uh, aspect of idealized self-image is a uh, neurotic claim. Now, a second aspect of, of this, uh, so in, in, in the search or in their search for uh, glory, neurotics build a fantasy world, a world that is out of sync with the real world. Believing that something is wrong with the outside world, they proclaim that they are special and therefore entitled to be treated in accordance with their idealized view of themselves because these demands are very much in accord with their idealized self-image. They fail to see that their claims of special privilege are unreasonable. The third is neurotic pride. Uh, the third aspect of idealized uh, self-image is neurotic pride, as I have said earlier. A false pride based not only on not on realistic view of the, uh, the true self, but on a, a spurious uh, image of the idealized self. Now, neurotic pride is quant qualitatively different from healthy pride or realistic self-esteem. Now, genuine self-esteem is based on realistic attributes and accomplishments and is generally expressed with quiet dignity. Neurotic pride, on the other hand, uh, is based on idealized image of self and is usually loud, uh, loudly proclamation or pro proclaimed in order to protect and support a glorified view of one's own self. Now, the second... Uh, or rather, Horn, I believe that Horn, I believe that self-hatred is an interrelated yet equally irrational and powerful tendency to despise or hate oneself. She believed that there are six ways people express self-hatred. People uh, with a neurotic search for glory can never be happy with themselves because they. Uh, realize that their real self does not match the insatiable demands of their idealized self. They will begin to hate and despite themselves. Horni recognize six major ways in which people express self-hatred. First, self-hatred self -hatred may result in, unrel in relentless demands on the self, which, is, or which are exemplified by the tyranny of the shoulds. For example, some people make demands on themselves that don't stop even when they achieve a measure of success. These people continue to push themselves towards perfection because they believe that they should be perfect. The second uh, mode of expressing self-hatred is merciless self-accusations. Neurotics constantly uh, berate themselves. Uh, they think that if people only knew me, they would realize that I am pretending to be knowledgeable, competent, and sincere. Uh, I'm really a fraud, but, not, uh, but no one knows it but myself. Self-accusations may take a variety of form, from obviously grandois uh, uh, expressions such as taking responsibility for natural disasters to... Uh, questioning the virtue of their own motivations. The third, uh, self-hatred may take the form of self-content, which might be expressed as belittling, disparaging, doubting, discrediting, and uh, ridiculing oneself. Self-contempt prevents people from striving for improvement or achievement. A young man may say to himself, you a uh, conceited idiot, what makes you think you can get a date with uh, the best-looking woman in town? A woman may attribute 
her successful career to luck. Although these people may be aware of their behaviors, they, uh, they have no perception of the self-hatred uh, that motivates it. A fourth expression of self-hatred is self-frustration. Horn I in 1950 distinguished between healthy self-discipline and neurotic self-frustration. The former involves postponing or foregoing pleasurable activities in order to achieve reasonable goals. Self-frustration stems from self-hatred and is designed to actualize an inflated self-image. Neurotics are frequently shackled by taboos against enjoyment. They may say, I don't deserve a new car. I must not wear nice clothes because many people around the world are in rags. They might even say that I must not strive for a better job because I'm not good enough for it. Fifth, uh, self Hatred may be manifested as self-torment or self-torture. Uh, although self-torment can exist in each of the other forms of self-hatred, it becomes a separate category when people's main intention is to inflict harm or suffering on themselves. People, uh, some people attain masochistic satisfaction by uh, anguishing over a decision exaggerating the pain of a headache, cutting themselves with a knife, starting a fight that they are sure to lose, or inviting physical abuse. The sixth and final form of self-hatred is self-destructive actions and impulses, which may be physical or psychological, conscious or unconscious, acute or chronic, carried out in action or enacted only in the imagination. Now, uh, at first glance, it may appear that Horney stole some Adler's best ideas. It's clear, for example, that her three coping strategies are very close to Adler's three types. It is, of course, quite uh, conceivable that she was influenced by Adler. But if you look at how she derived her three strategies by collapsing groups of neurotic needs, you see that she simply came uh, to the same conclusion from a different approach. There is no question, of course, that Adler and Horney and Fromm and Sullivan uh, form an, an unofficial school of psychiatry. They are often called Neo-Freudians, although uh, that is rather inaccurate. Unfortunately, the other common terms in the social psychologists, uh, which, uh, which while accurate, is a term already used for an area of study. Please notice how uh, Horney self-theories fleshes out Adler's theory about the difference between healthy and neurotic striving for perfection. And to uh, get ahead of ourselves a bit, how similar this conception is to Carl Rogers. I usually feel that when uh, different people come up with similar ideas rel relatively independently, this is a good sign we're getting at something valuable. Karen Horney had a couple more interesting ideas that should be mentioned here. First, she criticized Freud's idea of the penis envy. Although she conceded that it did not it, that it did occasionally occur in neurotic women, she felt strongly that it was not anywhere near to a, to, a, uh, to a universal. She suggested that what may appear to be sign of penis envy is really justified envy of men's power in the world. In fact, she suggested that there may also be a male counterpart to penis envy, womb envy. In some men who feel envious uh, of a woman's ability to bear children, perhaps the degree to which many men are, driv are driven to succeed and to have their names uh, live on after them is in compensation for their inability to more directly extend themselves into future uh, by means of carrying, burying, and nurturing their children. Second idea, one that uh, still gets a lit uh, gets little respect in this in, in, in the psychological community is self-analysis. Horn I wrote of one of uh, the earliest self-help books and suggested that with relatively minor neurotic problems, we could be our own psychiatrists. 
we, you can uh, see how this might threaten a few of her, uh, a few of delicate egos who make a living as therapist. Uh, I'm always surprised at the negative reaction some of my, uh, some of my colleagues have to people like Joyce Brothers, the famous psycho psychologist columnist. Apparently, if you aren't working within the official guidelines, your work is dismissed as pop psychology. Now, the major negative comment I might uh, think about uh, Horney is that uh, her theory is limited to the neurotics. Uh, besides living out psychotics and other problems, she actually lived, uh, lives out the truly healthy person. Nevertheless, since she does put neurosis and health on a single continuum, she does speak to the neurotics in all of us. Lastly, let's talk about Horney's concept of humanity. Horney's psychoanalytic social theory is rated uh, slightly higher on free choice than on determinism. Horney's theory is somewhat more optimistic than pessimistic. Uh, Horney actually believed that people possesses inherent curative powers that lead them towards self-realization. Um, on the dimension of causality versus teleology, uh, Horney adopted a middle position. She stated that the, na uh, that the natural goal for people is self-realization, but she also believed that childhood experiences can block that uh, movement. Uh, although Horney adopted a middle stance regarding conscious versus unconscious motivation, she believed that most people have only limited awareness of their own motives. Horney's concept of personality strongly emphasized social more than biological, uh, once for obvious reasons. Uh, because Horney's theory look almost exclusively at neurosis, it tends to highlight similarities among uh, people more than uniqueness. Horney's theory falls short on its power both to generate research and to submit to the criterion of falsifiability. Speculations from the theory uh, do not easily yield testable hypotheses and therefore lack both verifiability and falsifiability. Because her theory uh, deals mostly with neurotics, it's rated high on its ability to organize knowledge of neurotics, but, but very low on its capacity to explain what is known about people in general. The theory is not specific enough to give the practitioner a clear and uh, detailed course of action. On this criterion, the theory receives a low rating. So uh, this ends our lesson uh, on Karen Horney's uh, psychoanalytic social theory. My name is Dex Kamitan and thank you for watching.